so good morning uh, everyone bonjourto quanto a clients de souvenir se deviendra le resto ajoutoi nous avons un personne important que nous amenera vers les mémoires d'Arnaud madame Didi Ja i deem it as a great honor to welcome each and everyone to today's invited lecture Uh, Aniano is noted for uh, the deep imprinted memories which test the inner labyrinth of human mind. Today, we are fortunate enough to discuss Aniano at uh, this uh, event. So, uh, without uh, much uh, time ado, uh, I welcome everyone uh, to this uh, uh, today's event. Uh, now, uh, I directly uh, like to move towards the next uh, step. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Najla Tiwan, HOD of PG Department of English, MS Kevin College, and Coordinator IQSC, to uh, give her introductory remark. Over to you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Rudul. Uh, although I did not understand much of the French that you were saying, uh, this lecture is conducted as part of the Nobel Lecture Series that we do every year. to introduce the nobel laureates to the academic community and this year we have this invited lecture from a scholar from the department of french itself because we've got a french writer who's been nobeled this year in literature ani arno is a person who writes mostly non fiction you can call it memoir or her kind of writing is in the beginning of her 52 years of uh, writing she has written about 20 books and in the beginning it was mostly fiction which had autobiographical elements in it but later she stripped off the scrim of fiction and she started to write in the first person and this first person is not an imaginative persona but herself and she took from her life experiences when ani arno was uh, given this nobel prize there were mixed reactions and uh, maybe our uh, mostly our uh, resource person will talk about that more because her topic itself is class and gender in the works of ani arno her kind of work was criticized to be auto fiction so a newspaper in france itself reported that the high priestess of auto fiction has been given the nobel prize for writing about herself but today we all know that non fiction is what rules the publishing industry all over the world in india in america and if you take the whole publishing industry it's always non fiction that stands first in terms of sales even though it is self help that comes up but non fiction if you look at writers like ani arno or uh, uh, some other writers which we may be familiar with like june didion there are there is so much scope for non fiction and this nobel literature prize is giving uh, bringing our attention to this kind of writing ani arno is from a working class background and she has transcended the limits of class by means of her education she rose to the middle class and uh, by means of her talent she has risen to the cultural elite of writers so all these kinds of ideas that she puts into her work is not very well liked we can say and uh, again you know she is uh, has been criticized for being anti semite because she supports the palestinian cause and uh, she's been accused of being a feminist if you can accuse one of that because uh, she supports uh, she was against the uh, ban for hijab from the france government so and she was supporting the me too movement also so there are several fronts from which she had to face criticism but this kind of an acclaim of a nobel such a huge acclaim of getting a nobel prize has maybe at least silence their her detractors 
so today to talk about to talk more about her her kind of style is said to be decla a declarative style like uh, i don't know uh, how to pronounce in french but you know the uh, our resource person may be more adept to that uh, it's called literature flat i suppose right yeah flat writing is what we talk about when we talk about the style of writing that er and ani erno Uh, writes in, and she says uh, she herself says that she's not very good in juggling with metaphors, though she would have loved to have the pleasure of doing that. So anyway, uh, since we only get to know her through the translations, we have here with us Dr. Uh, or Miss Preetu Jha, uh, research scholar from the Department of English from EFLU, to take us through uh, a journey through the works of uh, Ani Arna. I welcome you, ma'am, to this program. Thank you so much for consenting to speak with us today, to our students and all the participants. Welcome, ma'am. I welcome our principal, who's the pillar behind all the programs that we do, the pillar of support here to our college and all the programs. I welcome you, sir, to this program. I welcome all the participants. We have had participants registrations from all over India and some even from outside. I welcome all the participants who are joining us online and all the participants who have gathered here in the auditorium in our AV hall to listen to Ms. Preetu talk on Ani Arna. Welcome all of you and all the faculty members from our department and others who have made this program possible. Welcome all. And may I now invite our principal to preside over today's proceedings? Thank you, Nizla. Uh, Dr. Tivai Nizla, head of the Department of English, other faculty, participants from various colleges, dear students, a warm morning to one and all. Here. We are eagerly waiting to listen, Ms. Prithuja, and she is going to deliver a talk on class and gender in the works of Nobel laureate Annie Erno. As you all know, that the Nobel Prize for Literature is a Swedish literature prize, and this prize is awarded annually since 1901. in the words of alfred nobel this prize is given to an author from any country who has produced the most outstanding work in an idealistic direction and this year it goes to annie erno and she belongs to france i think this is for the first time a french woman received a nobel prize for literature here i remember the program that you conducted last year titled writing across boundaries dr devanath an associate professor from gfgc kotagari made an extensive lecture on abdul aziz gurna and this year you have come up with ani erno I really congratulate the whole department for organizing this kind of programs, and I strongly believe this will help the students community. I am sure that Ms. Pridhuja will enlighten our students. I request all my students to listen to her perception on Ani Erno. Here, I convert my words. thank you thank you sir thank you for your kind words may i now invite uh, dr rechi to in, uh, introduce our guest and invite her a warm good morning to all let me introduce our chief guest for this nobel lecture series ms preetu ja is a research scholar in french literature at university foreign language university hyderabad she is working on two feminist writers annie erno and anne kinoff and she has completed her ba in french and ma in french literature and translation from the university of delhi 
She was the gold medalist of her master's batch in 2007. She also received a scholarship from the University of Delhi in collaboration with the University of Rennes and stayed in France for a year to study Francophone literature. She started her career as a guest lecturer of French in colleges affiliated to Delhi University. She also worked simultaneously at prestigious institutions like Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan. And she relocated to Bangalore in 2016 with her family and joined as the HOD of Foreign Languages in Greenwood High School. She also qualified IB Diploma Facilitator for French. And her love for literature pulled her back to research. And she's published uh, a published writer, a well-known writer uh, of short stories in French and has presented several papers in seminars uh, worldwide. So I invite you, ma'am, uh, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. A very good morning. My name is Preetu Jha, and I'm a research scholar at the French department at the EFL University, Hyderabad. I'm working on intersectionality and transclass feminism in the works of Annie Erdu and Anne Cunio. This morning, I feel highly privileged to be among you and share with you my understanding of the topic, class and gender in the works of Annie Erdu. Before we begin our journey towards knowing the acclaimed writer and her writings, I would like to thank the principal of the MES KVM College, Professor Shajid PP, HOD of the English Department, Dr. Nazila TY, and Assistant Professor Middle Sirminal for giving me this opportunity to speak and interact with you on this platform. Thank you very much. I'm speaking for, from Bangalore, and this is a beautiful, cool morning that can keep even a long talk bearable. I hope to engage you for the next 30 to 40 minutes, despite speaking from a distance, without asking you questions, throwing quite some literary theories, using jargon here and there, and most importantly, not being physically there to improvise my lecture if I see my listeners falling asleep. Dear all, I'm here to speak about class and gender in the works of Anne Yehno. When I drafted this title, I thought, wow, it sounds good. And then I realized it's easy on my ears because I'm from the French department and have been reading Annie Ernaud since what feels like ages. And I'm working on her. And here I will be in front of people from, uh, from uh, English department, some of whom uh, who have probably not known her before she won the Nobel Prize for Literature this year. And because they're not doing their PhD on her like me, they might be looking forward to the basic elements in her writing. So I have tried my best to keep my talk simple. Also, my PPT will not be loaded and will just highlight the key points of the presentation. Today's session will consist of four sections, and we will attempt to find answers to four important questions. One question in each section, section that have been put on the slide too. Who is Annie Ernaud? The first question is, who is Annie Erno? Please give me a minute. I'll share my PPT. Can you see my screen? Yes. Uh, I'm afraid I can't show it in uh, presentation form, so we have to do with this. I hope that's OK. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Uh, it would be better if you do that. It's okay. Uh, whatever. Uh, I am actually not able to uh, put it as a presentation, so uh, I am re really sorry for that. That's okay. That's okay. We can see it even now. Okay. So uh, we will attempt to answer, find answers to four important questions. Uh, one question uh, in each section that, uh, and these questions have been put on the slide too. The first question is, who is Annie Erno? Second question, what does she write about? Third question, how does she write what she writes? And finally, why is her writing important? Let us begin with the first question. Who is Annie Erno? Here, I would share with you a brief account of her life and background, followed by a two minutes long video on her. 
Annie Ernaux is a prolific French writer who has been discovered by the English speaking world with the arrival of her books in translation in recent years. This celebrated writer who has written 23 books over a span of 50 years was born on 1st September 1940 in Lillebonne, France to Catholic working class parents. Her parents were factory workers born to farmers. However, they had, by the time Anna was young, saved up and bought a small shop in Yipto, above which the family lived and ran a grocery and cafe. She went on to study at the University of Rouen and then Bordeaux, from where she qualified as a school teacher and gained a higher degree in modern literature in 1971. She worked as a school teacher in Bonneville and Pontoise before joining the National Center for Distance Education, where she was employed for 23 years. Erno began writing when she was in college. Yet, she had to face several rejections, and her first book, Les Armoires Vides, translated into English as Cleaned Out, was eventually published in 1974, making, marking the beginning of her exemplary literary career. Some of her notable works include A Woman's Story, A Man's Place, for which she won the Renaudot Prize in 1984, The Years, A Girl's Story, Happening, etc. Three of her novels, Happening, The Other One, and Simple Passion, have been adapted to films. The most recent being Happening, which received the Golden Lion at the 2021 Venice Film Festival. In 2022, she has been awarded with the Nobel Prize in Literature for her deeply personal books that speak candidly on incidents from her own life, highlighting class and gender. She is only the 17th woman and the first French woman to win the prize since its creation in 1901. The Nobel Committee awarded Erno, I quote, for the courage and clinical equity with which she uncovers the roots, estrangements, and collective restraints of personal memory." Unquote. In explaining its choice, the Swedish Academy said that, the, that Erno consistently and from different angles examines a life marked by strong disparities regarding gender, language, and class. This is exactly why I had decided to pursue my research on her. I found it fascinating to read a writer from a working class background who wrote about her class. Our perception of European life is mainly driven by the bourgeoisie and the elite. And the depiction of the working class from an insider gives you a different perspective. More so in her case, as she climbed up the social ladder and therefore gives unbiased evaluation of the class difference experience. Apart from this, Annie Ernaux has always been a politically engaged writer and voices her opinion on several national as well as global issues. Just as mentioned by Dr. Nazila, being a feminist, she always speaks for the women. Recently, she has shown her constant support to the Me Too movement. I would like to conclude the first section with the video that follows. After the video, we will take up the second question. What does she write about? So I will uh, try showing you the video. I hope, so these are the, the books that she has written, some of her important works. Uh, Ma'am, I think your slide is not changing. Is it the changing? Same. Is it changing no. now? No, it's not? OK. It's the same slide with the questions on it. OK. Can you see this one? Yes, now it is. Actually, you know, I'm not able to change it when I'm sharing my screen. So I'll just try playing the video. Let's see if it works. Okay. Yeah, Her name has been circulating for years around the Nobel Literature Prize. And now at 82 years old, esteemed French author Annie Arnaud has won. Her work is uncompromising and written in plain language, scraped clean. She has achieved something admirable and enduring. Her debut novel, Cleaned Out, came out in 1974. 
but she gained international recognition with the years, translated into English in 2017. Erno has written over 20 books, mainly autobiographical. Some are part of the French school curriculum. They follow her from her working class roots through to her arrival as a member of the literary elite, always with a critical eye on social structures. <laughs> An aspect of my work is to write from my position as a woman. Because it doesn't seem to me that women have reached equality. French President Emmanuel Macron congratulated her on Twitter, describing her voice as that of the freedom of women and of the forgotten. On the streets of Paris, people reacted to the news. Ah, bah, la liberté, la liberté ah choix, freedom, la liberté, freedom of choice, freedom to be and also et to dare to be. Être aussi. The Swedish Academy has been under pressure to become less Euro-centred and more diverse in its choices following its 2017 Me Too scandal. Erno is just the 17th woman to win the prize since 1901. She's also the 16th Nobel Literature Laureate to write in the French language, the second behind English while other languages and countries remain much less represented by the international prize. I hope you feel better connected to Arnie Erno after watching the video and that we all know her a little bit more. Now that we have spoken of her life and writing career, I would like to discuss with you what she writes about. To put it simply, she is a feminist writer who writes the story of women as well as the society in general. The common thread in her work is that it is heavily inspired by her experience and reflects on essential themes like family, class, gender, and politics. According to her official website, her writing, I quote, has continued to explore not only her own life experience, but also that her generation, her parents, women, anonymous, others enc encountered in public space, the forgotten, unquote. After publishing three novels, Cleaned Out, What They Say Goes, and The Frozen Woman, she turned to autobiographical writing with the 1984 book, A Man's Place. This novel is about her father and the society that created him. A few years later, she published a portrait of her mother titled A Woman's Story, which offers significant elucidations on the nature of Erno's writings, shifting between fiction, sociology, and history. These autobiographical works, like A Man's Place, A Woman's Story, Shame, Happening, explore her own life and that of her parents, but also the social milieu in which those lives evolved. In a woman's story, Anna writes, I quote, I am only the archivist, unquote. Indeed, in her books spanning over six decades, Erno has been the chronicler of not just her own experiences or that of her generation. She has also woven in fragments that speak of the lives of her parents' generation and those across the class divide. No wonder she is called the truth teller of France. While reading a woman's story, I particularly enjoy the parts where she talks about her grandmother, who kept everything from the cream of the milk to stale bread to make cakes, wood ashes for washing, or the morning wash water for washing hands throughout the day. That just resonates with us. Don't we all put water in the shampoo bottle when it is about to be over? Remember to murder the toothpaste tube while trying to squeeze out the last remains. You know, I have a friend who would cut open the toothpaste tube and never dispose of it unless it is wiped out clean. Anya Hano writes these stories. Intertwined with these stories are the serious feminist issues like abortion, female desire, and social equality. In a girl's story, she takes us back to the summer of 1958, where 18-year-old Erno submits her will to a man, and then he moves on, leaving her behind. She feels humiliated, 
we get to see how a man's desire is not rebuked, but a woman is shamed for her desires. In Happening, she narrates the story of a young French woman who wants to terminate an unwanted pregnancy in the 1960s when abortion was still illegal in France. Echno essays the bewilderment of this woman who is ready to risk her life during the procedure of abortion or to get imprisoned if caught as abortion was illegal. Though she feels lonely and helpless, she is determined to get the abortion done in order to make her own life. She does not want a child at the risk of her career. In A Frozen Woman, Enno writes about her 30 years old self when she was a teacher married to an executive, mother of two sons. She had a nice apartment and raised her beautiful children. And yet, like millions of other women, she has felt the enthusiasm, strength, and her happiness slowly ebb under the weight of her daily routine. The very condition that everyone around her seems to consider normal and coveted, coveted for a, a woman is killing her. It is ultimately the story of how she becomes the frozen woman of the title with hopes deadened, life dulled into routine, ambition thwarted. Annie Erno writes these stories, stories about women, their issues and struggles, the issues that may appear futile to men, but they plague women with boredom, regret, and fatigue. I have heard my mother went out her frustration several times about having to quit her job for the family. My friends keep telling me how overwhelmed they feel by the everyday challenges of motherhood. The gendered roles that society is assigned to women take a toll, but nobody talks about them. Anierno tells these stories. However, her work is not just limited to the depiction of women's lives. She also writes about French society in general. In fact, she gained international recognition after the publication of Lezane in 2008 translated into English as the years in 2017. In this book, she focused on how the French society, including her family and herself, functioned during the Second World War and the years after. She wrote about everything between 1941 and 2006, from photos, books, songs, to advertisements and consumerism. To sum up this part, I would like you to read through the slide. So I will try, uh, I hope you can see the slide. So uh, I would request you to read through it, take a minute and read through. Can you see this slide? The next one, how does she write what she writes? Yes, yes, we can. Okay. So that brings us to the third section of my presentation. How does she write what she writes? You must be wondering, what is this woman doing? Writing the same thing over and over again on the same slide? Friends, I have done it on purpose. Before getting into details about her writing style, I want you to look at the different styles of saying the same thing. The same thing can be put across in several ways. It can be flowery, fancy or flashy, twisted, inverted, or simply incomprehensible. None of these is Annie Erno. If we could give writers font names, she's our basic Times News Roman. Since the publication of Les Armoires Vides in 1974, Annie Ernaud has established a place for herself in contemporary French literature as a distinctive voice of the personal. In her writing, which is primarily autobiographical in nature, she defies the traditional Lejeunian notion about the possibilities and limits of those modes. Philippe Lejeune defined autobiography as I quote, the retrospective record in prose that a real person gives 
of his or her own being, emphasizing the personal life and in particular, the story of life, unquote. Annie Erno, on the other hand, does not focus on her life story in totality. She writes short narratives that recount isolated art autobiographical moments. Rather than recounting events and extrapolating their meaning to her life within an autobiographical text, she chooses a specific incident, a love relationship, an abortion, a scene of domestic violence, for example, and describes this in sparse, unlyrical prose with no discussion of its consequence upon her developing selfhood. This is why her writing is considered clinical, a writing style that is focused on message in a detached way. These moments of her life hang as though suspended in midair forming disjointed snapshots of episodes which invite identification or disidentification from the reader. Likewise, rather than linking these autobiographical moments into a coherent, cogent, and complete self that hints at the Lerginian no, uh, notion of autobiography as the history of development, uh, development of personality, Erno's texts defy linkage. Some narrators are identified by different names or not at all. She rejects a chronological approach to life writing and she plays with temporality. Erno has a rare simplicity of style. Warren Mott wrote in his article, Annie Erno's understatement published in 1995 that Erno's writing is minimalist. According to him, Erno intends to exploit minimalism's apparently, apparently paradoxical logic, the idea that extreme poverty of expression can in fact enrich the aesthetic experience. The minimalist belief is that in less, one experiences more closely, more intimately. Secondly, the minimalist gesture entails a refusal of conventional manner mannerism. In a man's place, Erno unapologetically announces her narrative strategy. I quote, in order to tell the story of a life governed by necessity, I have no right to adopt an artistic approach, no lyrical reminiscences, no triumphant displays of irony. This neutral writing style comes to me naturally, unquote. She describes her style as flat writing or écriture plat in French. This is a very objective view of the events she is describing, unshaped by florid description or overwhelming emotions. Despite the depth of her themes, Enno writes in simple, stripped-down prose, intent in its purpose of arriving at the heart of her experience. She is visceral in her documentation, writing in detail, be it about the pain, trauma, the shame of her working class childhood, her valiant attempt to remake herself through education and what it means to be a woman in a man's world. Writing as the feminist uh, move, movement gather momentum, Erno would invent an entirely new language for speaking directly about women's lives and desires. Far from much of the 1970s strand of French feminism, which sought to make sense of women's experience by appealing to the abstract language of philosophy or to the turns of phrase of so-called cultured literature, Erno kept her language grounded in the everyday. In her later work, The Years, published in 2008, she reflects on returning to her local dialects on visits to her hometown. I quote, the language that clung to the body was linked to slaps in the face the javel water smell of work coats, baked apples of winter long, the sound of piss in the night bucket, and the parents snoring." Unquote. She radicalizes the genre of memoir by using it to link her own individual experience with that of other members of her class, generation, and sex. To conclude this section on her light writing style, I invite you to read through the slide.
That brings us to the last section of my presentation today. Why is a writing important? In this last part, I hope to establish the relevance of her work. One is not born, but rather becomes a woman, wrote Simone de Beauvoir in Second Sex, and showed how a woman's choices, decisions, and even her thoughts are molded by the society she lives in. Every woman has to pass through a kind of preconceived trajectory in her life. Over the last few decades, there has been a remarkable upward shift in feminist scholarship on the role of gender in life and literature. We can see a diverse, engaged, and vibrant space where innovative literary forms are mobilized in ways that continue to stretch the possibilities and meanings of female experience. For example, a notable women's autobiographies have tried to move away from the model of the unique self, drawing on a tradition of a female self whose identity is formed in relation to others. Themes like marriage, abortion, pregnancy, motherhood, sexual emancipation, etc., are viewed through feminist lenses and are put fearlessly to words by women writers across the world. It is heartening to see a considerable body of research being built on the female experiences. However, research on literature by women who belong to the working class is not plenty and remains to be investigated more thoroughly as it, become, as it functions in conjunction with gender. It has become commonplace within feminist theory to claim that women's lives are constructed by multiple intersecting systems of oppression. This insight that oppression is not a singular process or a binary political relation, but is better understood as constituted by multiple converging or interwoven systems. To quote the renowned sociologist, sociologist Kingsley Davis, I quote, intersectionality is offered as a theoretical and political remedy to what is perhaps the most pressing problem facing contemporary feminism, the long and painful legacy of its exclusions, unquote. The inseparable relation between gender and class remains in place throughout Enno's increasingly autobiographical corpus. It is central to her project of understanding her identity and inquiring autonomy. If we look at Enno's work from Bakhtin's perspective, each of her work is the utterance of the working class woman. The nature of this utterance is dialogical in order to keep the feminist conversation going. In Nothing to Declare, Identity, Shame, and the Lower Middle Class, which appeared in the special issue of PMLA devoted entirely to the question of social class in January 2000, Rita Felsky reflects on how little autobiographical literature has been written by former or actual members of the British lower middle class and how little thought has been given to the improbability of self-disclosure by writers of this class origin. Felsky em emphasizes the persistent feeling of shame that produces this reluctance to speak about the past. She rightly points out that class identity can be, I quote, a structure of feeling, a complex psychological matrix acquired in childhood, unquote. Thus, it is sometimes impossible to escape the shaming effects of early class domination, even when a new class status has been achieved, as in case of Annie Ehrno. But Annie Ehrno stands out. For example, her novel Shame opens with a confession that Ehrno's father tried to kill her mother one Sunday in June 1952. And this particular story has never been written before. Erno is courageous and does not hesitate to reflect back on her past and clinically presents an authentic representation of the working class. Writing does not drown her in the shame of her class. It liberates her. In the course of over 20 books, Annie Erno has devoted herself 
to the excavation of her own life as well as that of her class. As Ellen Siksu observes, that women seldom wrote their history since they were denied such a position. If she did, she was not considered good enough, as her work was always viewed from a male point of view. I always like re repeating the story of Wuthering Heights, whose criticism changed once the identity of the author changed from Ellis Bell to Emily Bronte. The work, which were earlier regarded as extraordinary, now was reduced to a sentimentalist tale by a woman. The focus shifted from the work to the author. This always makes me think of Nivedita Menon's metaphor of nude makeup to patriarchal society. One spends hours ma making up one's face so as to give it a natural look. In the same way, patriarchal norms are so subtly re repeated through traditions that they appear to be the natural way and the woman is not considered good enough. I agree with Nancy Miller's stance that Rono Barth's postmodernist approach of the death of the author does not hold for women as it takes away the agency from them. The lived experiences of men and women are different. Her relation to textuality is different from the universality of literary positions. So, Let's celebrate Arni Ahnon, the author, for her courage and grit. I would like to conclude this presentation with a part of the trailer of the film Happening, which is a faithful adaptation of a novel by the same name. Why I picked this up? Because in this film, she's talking about abortion. And I think it's, it's really important in today's uh, date and time when uh, abortion is, uh, has again become illegal in the United States. Can you see my screen? Trailer? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. Bon, il faut trouver quelqu'un. Ça nous regarde pas. Ton frère. Playing from the middle. Yes. Embrasse-moi. Un Jean On risque rien là, t'es déjà enceinte, ça va J'aimerais avoir un enfant un jour. Mais pas un enfant, lui, tu nuis. Il faut l'accepter. Vous n'avez pas le choix. Qu'est-ce que t'as ah, Tu seras rien de là. I shared it uh, from the middle because, you know, uh, I, there were a few scenes in the beginning that I would not like to play before university uh, students. So uh, that brings uh, it to the end. Thank you very much, everyone, for being such a patient audience. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that enlightening lecture. Uh, is there any questions or anything, any comments or anything from the participants that you would like to say, the participants from outside our college also? Or any clarifications? I think if the participants have any questions, they can type it in the chat box as well. One of the participants would like to see your last slide, slide ma'am, just before the video, I think. Okay, I will share my screen. This one? Yes, I suppose so, yes. Okay. In the meantime, thank you so much, ma'am, in case there are no questions uh, for the presentation. And uh, from what uh, I have been reading and from what you have just talked to you, uh, talked to us about, uh, 
it you know she has commented that it takes a lot of courage to write about the things that she is writing and we can also realize that it takes a, a lot of courage yes to write about this and she says that she wants to write the kind of books uh, after which she'll not be able to look at anybody's face after this i think right yeah so, actually when her first book got uh, uh, you know selected by the publishers she did not come out of her room for two days because she was going to reveal a part of, of her of her background and that she had undergone uh, an illegal abortion so uh, now you know it, it's it's a, it's a different world but for her it was a very very uh, difficult experience Yes, we understand how difficult it will be to speak the truth about and then live through that life again. And uh, we see that she's been immensely successful. And like the film that you've shown, I think uh, she does collaborate with her son, I think, right, to uh, produce uh, these films. And, uh, not this one. This one is, no, not this one. This one, you know, why I picked up? Of course, because, you know, these in French films, we cannot play everything, uh, you know, in front of you know our sensibilities of our country but especially why i picked this up is because you know uh, when i was working on a presentation i realized that for example in india abortion is at least legalized maybe not for uh, women's rights for controlling population but at least we have uh, legal procedures to you know get it done now in uh, in places where abortion is not legalized or in time when it was not legalized women used hangers clips knives to self induce abortion and i find it really really uh, very uh, uh, something that makes me very angry and sad at the same time because you know uh, nobody goes and asks the man who is involved to take care of the baby it's always the the, the woman then why should you know she suffer so i think uh, you know anya no she talks about themes from our everyday life that is so true because uh, a lot of people do not talk about these uh, issues which are always swept under the carpet we uh, think of feminist kind of issues and we uh, kind of think of developing nations to be so much ahead of us but when we read these kinds of works we get to uh, see the you know realities of how class works and how gender works and how all of these kinds of issues can be there below the surface of uh, what we see in society yes uh, exactly so quite eye opening and there's a question in the chat box which says that though a lot of works uh, talk about gender and class why this particular work got nobel any unique aspect uh, actually uh, mm -hmm. nobel uh, prize is not given for any particular work it is given to the uh, to uh, you know uh, honor the body of work of a writer so uh, any erno got the nobel prize for talking about different uh, topics like you know about uh, women's cause uh, for her writing style the way she writes and everything it's not that that she got uh, the prize for a particular book yes and so it's given for the whole over the yes whole, uh, all the work of her. and and also you know here what i would like to add you know if we take an example from our day to day life imagine if one of our house helps becomes a writer and then she writes about her story that how she was you know uh, physically assaulted by her husband so that uh, you know that i think will uh, make her uh, more um, important according to me than than from us who are privileged to be educated and we have a certain background so uh, that is also one of the reasons why i think we should celebrate ani you know because she comes from the working class and she is not writing just as an outsider from an outside uh, point of view so yeah so that is why uh, you know she is Uh, selected but anyway she had to wait for 82 years she's 82 years old now so yeah uh, we do not uh, acknowledge that class very much yes so literature uh, what we find is that it's 
literature when we teach literature also it's not just about the style language and the uh, figurative stuff the uh, literary devices that we talk about it's also about the content and the substance and uh, it's not uh, for uh, any mean reason that we call it humanities also because we talk about humanity so uh, the reality of human existence is also something that is very important when we study literature and uh, yes she talks about the contempt uh, when we talk about ani or not she talks about the contempt that uh, the rich have for the poor or men have for women or uh, the dominant have for the downtrodden so uh, i guess this is a very important nobel prize uh, you know so that uh, we have these kinds of conversations and we look at these kinds of works of course uh, it should not be about awards but it is usually happens that when we uh, listen to uh, some um, prizes being announced <laughs> Ms. Nagalakshmi, could you please mute your mic? Uh, it does give the work a lot of visibility, and uh, yes, so we are talking about Ani Arno here uh, in India, sitting at MS Kavim College, Valanchery, and uh, Ms. Preetu at Bangalore. So thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us. I hope you're still here, ma'am. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for the lecture. May I invite uh, Miss Sana Arif, uh, assistant professor? Yeah. Is, is there any more questions before we formally wind up this session? Is there anything anybody would like to add? Yeah. We have not many questions, but we have a lot of comments in the chat box that have uh, expressed their gratitude for this talk to Miss Preetu. Observation that uh, it is related to the political activism uh, of Ani Arno. Uh, as uh, Dr. Nazila mentioned, uh, there were uh, you know like uh, accusations that uh, okay. she's anti-Semitic uh, and uh, her uh, you know for, uh, she advocated for the release of Georges Abdullah, uh, who is responsible for the uh, you know massacre of the Israeli diplomats, etc. So there are a lot of controversies also there. So I was just uh, wondering that. Uh, from your uh, you know years of research um, how do you think anya you know is uh, you know like uh, defending this kind of uh, accusations is there any particular uh, accu you know arguments that she have or uh, she is just uh, you know standing there for the oppressed so what is your observation uh, this is exactly a question that she was asked in one of the interviews and then uh, she said that uh, you know i i am not very fond of this question because would you ask somebody who is not from the working class this question uh would you ask a man this question that uh, how do you deal with these uh, kinds of accusi uh, accusations she just says i i am not a woman working class writer i'm just a writer and above all i am a human being so this is what she believes in being a feminist doesn't mean that you know she just have to uh, to you know work for the equality of women to, uh, be anti men not bother about uh, other uh, social issues she she feels that as a human being it's it's her uh, responsibility to talk about issues that need her voice and how she says that she just doesn't have to deal with these accusations because she thinks that uh, you know in the interview she says whatever i do or i don't do people will have always have an opinion so being a politically uh, engaged writer mm -hmm. it's my responsibility to voice my opinion without uh, having the fear of being judged and especially because she says that she has always been judged because of her because of her uh, background so she says in in the interview so i'm just repeating that i don't have to deal with them it's just a part of my life i i just keep doing what i want to do yes thank you it always happens that only one side gets hurt but then when we listen to the opposite side uh, people get intolerant sometimes so uh, there are just some comments in the chat box if there are no more questions Thank you, Mr. Sanjay, for the comment. Yeah, if we could just read that out, Sana, could you just? Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, sir. One of our participants, Mr. Sanjay Kumar, has given a detailed comment. Let's see what's that. Pierre Bourgeois, a French writer, says that the difference between the powerful people and the powerless people is that the powerful people exist twice over. First, they exist with their body, eating, walking. First, they exist with their body, eating, walking, making love, and then they exist in the world of representation on TV, film, newspaper, literature. Ani Arnaud should be given the credit to represent a class which has not been finding much place in French literature for now. I think that's a very detailed and a very good insight in the work of Ani Arnaud. And I think that is what uh, she does because as uh, Ms. Pethi's position that uh, most of her works are minimalistic and you don't see that kind of ornamentation with other uh, kind of French writers. So that's a good observation. And I would like to acknowledge that Dr. Sanjay Kumar is my guide. So, uh, okay. <laughs> so thank you, sir, for uh, for listening to the talk today. Thank you, sir, for your comments also. Uh, so yes, so a lot of uh, so what we hear and what we see is maybe from those who are privileged to be writing and like what Ms. Prikucha said. If we get a chance to hear from our house help, we should not be surprised. We should actually welcome a different voice into the literary space. Yes. So any more comments from any of the participants? Dear students, if you have any questions, you may ask. I guess the students are a bit limited in their mic space over there, uh -huh. they yeah. could they could come forward. If you have any questions, you can come forward and you can uh, ask the questions. Okay, I suppose we have kept our speaker. Thank you so much, ma'am. Once again, I think there are no more questions and no more comments. I suppose. Thank you so much, ma'am, for this enlightening talk. Okay. Uh, but we just. There's just one more question if uh, you are willing to take it. Otherwise, we are winding up. This is the last one. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, can class struggle be linked to career women? Uh, <laughs> working class women have always been career women. They don't have a choice. So I think uh, when we uh, link class struggle with career, it's rather a very Eurocentric uh, white women concern wherein uh, for them you know being a feminist meant going out of their house and fi finding a job and uh, you know earning money because they had all the other comforts of life so uh, no uh, i i don't think that it applies to all the sections because working class women uh, women from lower middle class they they don't have a choice of not working they have to work so no but yes for middle class uh, women Yes. Here, you know, I would like to uh, talk about Bell Hooks, uh, who is a feminist writer. And she, she, she says very clearly, uh, you know, uh, I would recommend this book to everyone who wants to know a little bit of about feminism, that feminism is for everybody by Bell Hooks, wherein she's actually talking about uh, this notion that we have that uh, being a career woman is 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 a core theme in uh, in feminism and in class struggle it is not you're welcome thank you Aditya. okay ma'am so i think we are almost uh, coming to the end of our session now that was our last question Thank you for the wonderful presentation. May I now invite Ms. Sana Arif, Assistant Professor from uh, English Department here, to propose the word of thanks. Hong. Honorable Principal, Professor Shahjit Bibi, our esteemed invited speaker, Ms. Preetil Jha, our very own IQAC coordinator and HOD English Department, Dr. Najila T.Y. Dear teachers, my dear students, and our most valued participants who joined us online for this event. Once again, a very good morning to all of you. I feel honored and privileged to present this vote of thanks to all of you on the behalf of the PG Department of English and IQAC. 
Firstly, I'd like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our principal, Professor Shajid Piki, with whose permission and under whose guidance this event could be made possible. Thank you, sir, for always encouraging us to organize such events that help our students grow intellectually. A very special thanks to our invited speaker, Ms. Preetu Jha, for accepting our invitation, for joining us today, and for giving such a wonderful lecture. Thank you, Ms. Jha. Truly, it was a power-packed and a remarkable lecture on Annie Hartnoff, the recipient of 2022 Nobel Prize in Literature. How excellently you uh, explained the style of Anya Noor's writing and the issue of class and gender in her works. Thank you very much for such an enlightening and stimulating lecture. Thank you. A big thank you to the teachers of the PG Department of English who helped organize and handle the event throughout. Uh, I would also like to place on record my sincere gratitude to all the people who work behind the scene to help conduct this event successfully. Thank you so much. Finally, a wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants for making the time to be with us today and make this event a wonderful one. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, all participants. Uh, please make sure to fill the feedback form uh, before leaving. This feedback link is uh, active. It is, it is active. active. We are in it. Might be Ms. Patricia, thank you for your presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ms. Preetu. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Ma'am, the link is not you. working. Uh, yes, sir. We'll check that right now. Please do not leave the meet. We, just, we are just uh, looking into the matter right now. Just check it out. Just open that link. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, will you post that link in the uh, WhatsApp group? Uh, yeah, we'll do that then. Uh, but get the... okay. Yeah, we'll share it in the WhatsApp group. Yeah, so you can leave it. I would thank also you. like like to thank uh, Mridul sir for uh, you know keeping me informed about each and every development. So I appreciate that sir very much. Thank you. And we didn't have to postpone, and you were so kind enough to. Uh, oh, that, that's all right. That it was unforeseen. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you all participants. See you then with another talk. <laughs>